Good afternoon and welcome to Open Classroom. I'm Janet Gillow, Director of Professional Development for the Brown School. So delighted that you are here to join us today. Um, and I am joined by my special guest co-host, Dan Ferris, who's our Assistant Dean for Policy Initiatives. Uh, Dan and I will be fielding chat and um, questions for the presenter as we go. Before I pivot to today's conversation, I wanna share a few program notes with you, things going on at the Brown School that you may wanna participate in. Uh, the first one is uh, after weeks and weeks and weeks of work on Friday, we launched a project that I'm particularly excited about. It's a uh, Foundations of Pandemic Preparedness and Response, 20 hour self-paced um, certificate program. I will throw a link into the chat, but many uh, faculty and staff, including Dan, um, contributed to this and we are delighted it's ready to share with you. Um, in the Open Classroom series, upcoming tomorrow, we have the third offering in our Medicaid expansion, Supporting a Healthier Missouri program. Um, at, at 12.30, we'll be live, and that program um, focuses on the impact of, to uh, families with children. And then next week, on Tuesday, we're back um, with our COVID-19 and race series, a program, The High Price of Economic Injustice. So those are open for registration, free, um, and we would love to have you join us if the topics are of interest. So now let's talk about today. Very excited about this conversation. Um, our speaker is Dr. Timothy McBride, and he serves as the Bernard Becker Professor at the Brown School. He's also the co-director of the Center for Health Economics and Policy at Washington University's Institute for Public Health. Tim is an influential health policy analyst who helps shape the national agenda in health insurance, rural health care, Medicaid and Medicare policy and access to health care. And as many of you know, Tim is the real deal, regularly consulting and testifying, which is why this is actually a reschedule of the program we hope to do back in June, but he was busy testifying and making the world a better place. So delighted to have him with us now and delighted you all could join us. Tim's research interests include the effects of health uh, reform at state and national levels, the uninsured diabetes policy, Medicare Advantage and long-term and long-term entitlement reform. Uh, so today to speak to us on facing the challenges of health policy and economics during the COVID-19 pandemic, please welcome my friend and fellow Cardinals fan, Dr. Timothy McBride. Thanks so much, Janet. Um, and I will apologize for um, having to reschedule from last month. And I appreciate the indulgence of Janet Gillow and those members of the audience who uh, had planned to be part of the crowd last time. So um, it definitely is something I don't like to do when I commit to doing something, I, I do it um, unless I'm really sick. Um, but uh, as Janet mentioned, um, there was a hearing called, uh, it was pretty short notice on Medicaid expansion and here's some pictures to prove it. Um, and um, and uh, so the Missouri House Budget Committee called an, a hearing and I felt like I should uh, show up because, uh, and I'll talk about this later, the subject of the hearing was the fiscal analysis we had done on the Medicaid expansion initiative. Um, and, um, you know, everything's uh, very interesting right now with the COVID-19. Um, and as you may know, um, hearings are not being done in the regular hearing rooms for social distancing purposes. So um, we have a very beautiful um, Capitol building um, and I've only set foot one other time actually in the house chamber, um, but the actual hearing set foot in the house chamber. And so I got to spend um, seven hours in the house chamber for that hearing. And I was uh, testifying for 90 minutes, which was quite interesting. So, um, and um, that tape of that exists and that picture is from that. Um, as Janet mentioned, I'm a co-director of the Center for Health Economics and Policy, and this is uh, my co-director, uh, uh, Karen Joint Maddox. And if you don't know what the center's about, here's uh, what it's all about. Um, we, uh, um, Bill Powderly, who's the director of the Institute for Public Health, likes to say that, um, you know, it's a very good thing that we, um, you know, sadly in what, many ways that we produce this Institute for Public Health now, because this 100 year pandemic, um, you know, last time we had a pandemic of this sort, in the world was, uh, you know, around 1918, 1919. Um, and now WashU is um, ready for dealing with this um, issue. And 
we've been very busy um, dealing with all sorts of issues around us in our Center for Health Economics and Policy is, um, uh, frankly, I don't know if I've ever been as busy as I am now and my colleagues as well. So you can see some of the issues that our center is dealing with. So um, today I wanna talk about um, the challenges that uh, the, the COVID raises. Um, and I'm gonna bring up um, some issues that I don't think get as much attention. And I was so glad that, um, you know, the, the Brown School is doing these uh, open classroom courses. Um, so I jumped at the opportunity to do this to talk about um, what frankly has been uh, a fixation of mine most of the summer. Um, as we've been social distancing at home to think about the policy and economic aspects of COVID. And um, because really what's going on right now with the pandemic is not just the pandemic, um, as I'm sure, you know, it's clear to everybody, our country is facing three challenges at once, um, not just the pandemic, but a recession, a huge recession. Um, and a racial justice crisis, um, which has um, clearly emerged you know, it's been there for a long time, but uh, um, you know, it's reemerged in many um, profound ways in the last few weeks or months. Um, so uh, that's really, um, it's, you know, a very tough time. And, and they cross in very interesting and profound ways. Um, and then now, as Janet mentioned, um, next week we'll be voting on Medicaid expansion in Missouri, so I'll touch on that in the latter half of my talk. Um, so, so the pandemic, um, I won't spend a whole lot of time going through a lot of the numbers here because I believe you probably have talked about this um, other open courses or you know something about this, but I wanna use it as a touchstone to talk mostly about the economic and policy aspects of this. Um, so here's charts you probably have seen. If you're like me, you fixate on this, you wake up in the morning, you look at these charts, and this is the chart from the uh, New York Times that I think I pulled down this morning, and um, and the reported cases in the uh, United States, and you know, we, we saw the, the rise in the cases, then we sort of were doing pretty well going into June, um, but now we're, we're, we're starting to see a pretty big increase again. Uh, going into mid-July, and we, we had hoped that July, the summer, was going to be a time when we would see um, um, a slowdown in um, the pandemic, but we're not seeing that, uh, mostly in the southern United States. Um, one of the things I wanted to sh uh, point out to you is this is a chart from a website that is identified below, um, covid19.healthdata.org, which keeps track of all the it gives you a measure of social distancing, all the sort of policy measures that are put in place um, uh, to things like uh, social distancing and uh, stay at home measures and so on. And the top, uh, this at zero here is basically no social distancing. So you can see by the beginning of March here, we were doing no social distancing. Then we had major shutdowns across the United States. And then, you know, then we started opening up a bit and now we're more opened up and although these lines don't roughly, they don't completely, um, I couldn't make them align completely, but you can see that as we started to open up, the number of cases started to rise again. So, so as the COVID cases started, um, as we started to open up, the COVID cases started to rise. Um, but you know, the point I'm gonna be pointing out in a minute is um, the, what the shutdowns meant in terms of economics. So what questions are raised about this for economics and policy? Um, the big one is around the recession, or the one I'm gonna talk about a lot in this presentation is how big is it? How long will it last? Will these job losses be permanent? Um, how is the health sector itself affected? how many people will lose health insurance or have already lost health insurance. And um, a lot of us in public health think about this diagram um, and social determinants. And as people lose their jobs and their income, how will it affect them when they move into poverty and how will it affect um, uh, poverty, joblessness, uh, lack of health insurance, their access to health status and, and so on. Um, and then disparities. Um, we know already that um, and I'll show you some evidence on this, that the people losing jobs are more likely to be people of color. 
um, and the people, uh, low wage workers are more likely to uh, be exposed to COVID. And we think that's one of the reasons why um, the COVID rates are higher for people of color. And then again, I'll talk about the Medicaid expansion initiative in Missouri and is that part of an answer to the COVID question. So um, again, uh, there's not been, in my opinion, a lot of focus on the recession. Um, so, and I'm an economist, so I'm gonna take you through some of this without equations and graphs and so on. Um, just some nice looking pictures and uh, stories. Um, but just to illustrate to you how profound this story really is that we're looking at. And this is one graph to show you that this recession that hit in March and April of 2020 um, is so severe that it's greater than any recession we've seen since the Great Re Great Depression. I wanna say that one more time. This is the greatest, the biggest depression we've seen in magnitude since the Great Depression. Bigger than the Great, this right here is the Great Recession. If you can remember the Great Recession of 2007 to 2009, that's looked like a little blip compared to what we've seen in the last few months. That's remarkable. So this 25% drop in in spending um, is bigger is as big as the Great Depression. Now I'll show you later that we come back some from that, but that's one story I want you to think about. Um, many of you have seen week by week on Thursday we get this report of number of people filing for uh, unemployment claims. Um, for example, my son's been uh, furloughed. Um, and so once the shutdown started, um, right here about mid-March, that's the gray bars here every week, we get another um, number of people that are filing for unemployment. And just to give you again, a context of that, the record number of people that ever filed, sorry about that, this always happens. Um, uh, the number of people that filed for um, uh, unemployment claims was 750,000 in the Great Recession, 750,000. And in March, the number was 7 million, 7 million, 10 times higher, 7 million. This was down here like 750,000, and it was went up to 7 million. And we are now in the territory of like 1.5 million, and we're thinking, oh, well, that's pretty good. It's dropped. But it's still twice as big as it was in the Great Recession. That is like remarkable, um, horribly remarkable. So, you know, then this red line is the number of people who are continually unemployed, and that's about 20 million now. Um, so that's, this is huge. And if I sound a little, um, I think this is a pretty big deal. I think it's a pretty big deal. Um, so the official unemployment rate, and there'll probably be some questions about all these different definitions, but every month there's a survey that's done that asks how many people are you officially unemployed or not. That's the blue number right here. And we we were at historically low levels of about three to 4% officially unemployed in March. And you know, we hit, if you kept track of this, we had a, a 10 year run of record low unemployment numbers. And then we went up to a very large number of 14% unemployed, one out of six people basically unemployed. Um, and that number, just again, to tell you how big that is, we never hit a number like that during the Great Recession. That's the largest unemployment number we've had since the Great Depression. You have to go back to 1939 to see a number that high. 1939. Um, but yet if you added in the number of people that um, this gray area here, basically it's the people who were furloughed. We furloughed a lot of people at Washington University, for example, that's the gray area. These are people who are working part-time that really want a full-time job. And these are the people that just gave up and went home and left the workforce. If you add that up, it's about a third of the population that was not working. So, and you know, now it's dropped, that's good, but it's still 11%, very high. You know, the Great Depression was 25% at its peak. The Great Recession was 10%. So we're still higher than that. Um, there's a lot of numbers in this chart, but look at this words here. I want to say, point out to you, we've lost 16 million jobs just since this started. Um, 
and five million people have left the, the workforce. And a number that sort of amazes me as an economist is we, we hit a percentage of people that's a number that economists look at is the number of people that are employed as a percentage of the population went to almost 50% of the population. So half the people weren't working, half the people were working. That's really pretty remarkable. We were, as you look up here, at about 60%. So that's pretty remarkable. Where did we lose some of those jobs? We lost them. Um, you probably know this just instinctively because you saw this around you and you could tell it from what was happening. We lost it in leisure and hospitality. We lost it in things like hotels and travel. Um, we lost it in, um, that was the main thing. We lost in retail uh, jobs. We lost in transportation, airplanes, and um, people aren't doing travel and so on. Um, we, I think this is really important for a school of social work in particular to pay attention to, school of public health. Who's actually being affected by this? I don't think we're talking about this enough. It's young people, people that are 16 to 20, 19, 20 to 24. It's not so much middle-aged people, but still a lot of jobs being lost, but it's younger workers. It's people who are lower educated, people with less than a high school diploma, not so many people who are higher educated. They're being protected from this to a large extent. And it's people of color, of course, as who are always affected by these things. Um, not white workers are not immune from this, but um, black minus 14%, Latinos minus 13%, interesting Asian minus 15%. My guess, I haven't dug into those numbers, my guess is that part of that's being driven by um, uh, American Indians being in that group as well. But um, so, so the usual groups that get, um, that are often hit by um, recessions, young people, low educated workers, people of color, are people that we need to be worried about. Um, so what about the healthcare sector? I will tell you as a health economist in my career, I've never seen the health sector have a recession. I'll say that again. The healthcare sector's never lost jobs. And you can see that in this green line here, it never goes below zero. The healthcare sector is recession proof. It doesn't lose jobs. So here's a recession, here's a recession, here's a recession, here's a great recession. But the health sector never lost jobs, except here. The healthcare sector is having a recession. Well, probably not a big surprise. Healthcare sector um, is, well, I'll explain to you why it lost a lot of jobs. It lost 1.6 million jobs between in March and April alone. And, um, and so uh, actually this slide, I'll, I can probably just move past this. The net job loss now is 647,000 jobs in the health sector. Um, and is it the biggest part of the job loss? Again, most of the job losses are in leisure and hospitality and things like government and professional services, but the job losses are really big in physicians' offices, dentists' offices, other ambulatory care, hospitals, nursing facilities. What's going on? Well, in the shutdown, when people stayed at home, they said non-essential healthcare had to stop. And, you know, to make room for COVID and, um, and because they didn't want people infecting uh, healthcare workers and so on, and as we know from WashU, some of the research stopped as well. So um, 647,000 healthcare workers lost their jobs. Um, I, in the initial phase, half of the dent workers in dental offices were either laid off or put on furlough. Half, half of them. Many of them have gone back to work. I've gotten a lot of dental work done in the last two weeks. Um, so so um, it was all backed up, but uh, so, uh, and 310,000 jobs were lost in education too. Um, so, uh, so, you know, the, it's, um, I've never seen anything like this in my career. Um, and we, we're probably not done with this. 
I'll sort of pass through this slide because some of this is repeating itself, but um, again, uh, dental offices, 92,000 jobs lost and so on. I'll skip that slide. Um, in terms of spending loss, here's the spending loss in healthcare, three months of downturn in health spending loss. And you can see it's pretty much all parts of the healthcare sector except drugs. Um, and you can see that dental took a big hit, physicians' offices took a big hit, hospital care, strangely enough, has really surprised people. People said, well, they're going to get, you know, get treated for COVID, but everything else stopped. Um, one of the big questions that a lot of us are wondering about in terms of research is people stopped going in for heart, heart disease. People stopped having heart attacks. Well, why is that? Um, big research question, actually. So, um, so, um, so the big question looking forward that economists are pondering about is how long will this last? I can tell you a lot of economists, sorry about the cat, uh, a lot of us economists are, a lot of economists that I talked to predicted that this would look like a V-shaped recession. This is a V here. You know, it, it was profound and deep. And then we would come back. And I can tell you some of the politicians in Washington want that to happen. You know, the ones who are incumbents who are running for office want that to happen because then they can get reelected because if this can come back by the time of the election, they'll go, ah, great. Um, so, and we're probably going to see some of this. Um, but here's the thing that should scare us a little bit. This blue line is what was in place beforehand. This is called pre-COVID unemployment rate. But look at this, it went up to about 11, 12%. And what this, this is the Congressional Budget Office projections. They're telling us that it's gonna take years for the unemployment rate to return back to its 4% level. And by 2026, we're still gonna be at 6%. By 2023, we're still gonna be at six or 7%. So it's gonna take years for the unemployment to work its way out. Um, so that's a little scary. Um, and that happened after the last Great Recession. It probably took five years for the Great Recession to really wash it away out for us to get back to our pre-recession levels. And that's something that we need to be worried about. I, I should tell you, economists like to be dismal. This is where I'm being dismal. Um, but, you know, and of course, I don't want this to happen. But so why would that maybe happen? Here's one thing that really worries me. Um, I found a slide when I was looking at, um, this was from an article in Bloomberg. There were a lot of businesses, and you don't have to drive around very far to see this happening. There have been a lot of businesses that have shut down. Practically every day when I open the newspaper, I read about another retail business that's shut down for good. Um, we've seen businesses that I never thought would shut down. Most of them retail businesses. Frankly, I don't understand how the airlines are still in business. Um, I think they're being pumped up by uh, subsidies, but um, there's a lot of small and medium businesses that are closing. Some of these are temporary closures, of course, but you can see we're starting to see a, a rise in the percentage of closures that are permanent. And when those closures become permanent, what is that going to do to unemployment? That's what, that's one of the things that's worrying me and other economists. Um, and of course, I hope that that reverses, but that's one of my worrying symbols. So when people lose jobs, what's happening to their health insurance? If it's just a furlough and they're gone for a few weeks, hopefully their employer can keep them on their insurance for a few weeks or a month. And I know when I was came out of hibernation in my house and went and got a haircut, my hair was really long. And I went back, I asked my hairstylist, you know, did you lose insurance? Because that's just what I study. She said, oh, no, my, um, my employer is really nice. They kept us on our insurance. I said, well, that's great. Um, so I think some employers did that. I, I believe WashU did that as well. Um, but, you know, after a while, that's going to be harder and harder to do. And, of course, if the closure is permanent, some people are going to lose insurance. So a, a study just came out from, sorry, Families USA 
that predicted that um, five million people might have, might be have already lost their health insurance. As you know, as you may know from the Affordable Care Act, we started with 50 million uninsured in 2013. We've lowered that number by probably 20 million, and we now have maybe added 5 million to that number. We added, um, and that's this red bar here, um, maybe 100,000 in Missouri alone is what they predict. So we've added um, Missouri's, that's about um, how many people that have lost their jobs as well. Um, so, and here's a map of the uninsurance rates in the country. Um, it's almost like a heat map, the redder the number, the higher the uninsurance rate. It's not a coincidence that the Southern states are the ones that have not expanded Medicaid, including Missouri. Um, Missouri's rate is 16% for adults. Um, and so, um, and, um, so mostly Southern type states have relatively high uninsurance rates. Dan and I were talking about this slide earlier. I think this may be one of the most interesting slides going back to the title of this presentation. So what is, what is this uh, COVID, the recession, the lack of insurance mean and this moment we're in right now where COVID's breaking out in the South? Um, there's a slide in this paper and you can download and look at it if you want that's a little bit scary. Um, and this may take a minute to, to describe what's going on in this table, but I found this rather scary and profound. So on the left-hand side here are the states ranked with the highest on insurance rates since the top 10 states and goes from Texas with the 29%, Florida, 25% and so on down to Tennessee. And of those 10 states, only one of them has not expanded Medicaid and that's Nevada, the red one here. So all the rest of these states have not expanded Medicaid. Um, Oklahoma just voted to expand Medicaid, but it's still a not expansion Medicaid state. That's why I have a star there. On the right hand side is the increase in COVID rates in the seven days up until July 12th, 2020. Is you, and I italicize the three states that are on the right-hand side that are not on the left-hand side. So seven of the 10 states on the right-hand side are on the left-hand side. So what that tells you is most of the states on the right-hand side with rapidly increasing COVID rates also have high uninsured rates. That scares me because they have high COVID rates and rising COVID rates and they have a lot of people who are uninsured. That scares me. And we, you probably don't need to look at the table to realize that because we know that this is where the COVID rates are rising. And, and this is where the uninsurance rates are and this is where the COVID rates are rising. So at this moment of time in particular, this is one of the things that's worrying a lot of us. So that's what this slide tells you. Um, it's not cause and effect right now, but who's paying for these people? That's the question. So that raises the question and in the last few minutes, I'll talk about Medicaid expansion and Janet tells me that, or told you all that we've been doing presentations about Medicaid expansion and I have, and we got plenty of time it looks like to talk about Medicaid expansion. So um, I talk quickly. Um, so uh, I wanna take you through um, the Medicaid expansion question in Missouri because we're gonna vote on this next week. And our center um, did a fiscal analysis of this, which has gotten a lot of attention and that's why I wasn't here last month. So I just wanted to, I thought it would be useful to run through this and maybe talk a little bit about the, the issue if people wanna ask questions about it. Um, so we first, a little bit of a background on it. Here's the current state of the world on Medicaid expansion, United States at least. Um, since there are some people from the world uh, here. Um, so uh, the Affordable Care Act encouraged states to expand Medicaid. Um, as of this moment, 38 states, including DC, have expanded, decided to expand Medicaid, including Oklahoma. Um, it's marked as a light um, blue state on here um, because they adopted Medicaid. Technically, they're not 
expansion state yet, but they will be. Um, so Missouri is one of the 13 states in dark blue here that have not. What that means is when a state expands Medicaid, they can uh, expand up to, uh, with incomes up to 138% of poverty. And if they do that, um, they get a, what's called a higher matching rate. The federal government pays 90% of the costs and the state pays 10%. Currently um, in Missouri, the federal government pays 65% of the costs and the state pays 35% of the costs. That varies by state. In some states, it's 50% and 50%, um, like in New York. Um, in in lower, lower income states, it can go 70% um, for the uh, federal government. We tend to be somewhere in the middle there at 65, 35. But what Medicaid expansion does is allows you to cover more people at a higher poverty level rate with the federal government helping you pay for it. Um, so currently in Missouri, we tend to cover people at a categorical level. We cover people who are aged, blind, and disabled, pregnant women and children, and a certain number of um, small, uh, certain population group, cate uh, other categories. Um, up to a certain minimum income levels. Those are called mandatory eligibles. Um, we, I'll show you in a minute, our eligible levels are quite low. Next week on Tuesday, we will vote on August 4th to decide whether to expand Medicaid or not. It's a constitutional amendment. Um, here's our current eligibility levels. Basically, the story is um, if you're aged, blind, or disabled, it's our eligibility levels are fairly generous. 87% uh, of poverty gets you on the program. If you're a child, you can get eligible up to 300% of poverty. If you're a pregnant woman during the period before and after pregnancy, short period, you can get on Medicaid. But basically, if you're a childless adult, you're period not eligible at all, period. Um, if you're a custodial parent, our eligibility level is 21% of poverty. It's one of the lowest in the country, if not the lowest. 21% of poverty, just so you know, is um, on my screen, it's covered up. It's about $4,000 per year um, because the income level um, for a family of three, as you can see, is about $21,000. So that means $4,000 a year. You can't make that, then you're no longer eligible. So that's really low. Um, and so basically, again, you are not eligible at all if you're a childless adult. You're not eligible if you're between 20% of poverty and 100% of poverty. At 100% of poverty, you can go into the marketplaces for the ACA and get subsidies. So that's what's called the gap. What the expansion would do, um, based on our analysis, you can download it. It's up on our website. Here's the link. Um, would expand coverage to 230,000 adults, we estimated, and about 40,000 children. The total cost of doing that is a little over a billion dollars. Um, now, again, uh, the federal government would pay 90% of those costs. The state's initial costs would be about 120 million for the adult share of that. But we estimate that after considering cost, uh, cost savings, that the state would accrue savings of about $40 million to its general fund. That surprises some people, doesn't surprise most people who looked at the research on this. Um, there's some controversy over this. Um, I'll walk you through the numbers in a second. Um, but this estimate was submitted about a year ago. Um, and put up on our website. And then it became the basis of the auditor's estimate, which is now on the ballot. Um, so the savings generally fall into four categories. Um, again, the main savings is the federal government pays 90% of the costs. The other savings come from four different categories, basically um, five. Uh, the disabled spend down population, some of the disabled population Generally, every month spends down. Um, it, these are people like kidney dialysis population um, that they know every month that their uh, expenses exceed their income and they become eligible for Medicaid even though their income's above the eligibility level. Um, in a Medicaid expansion world, um, they would just become eligible immediately. Say if they're like 90% of the poverty line, they would just 
it would be smart for them to just sign up for Medicaid and not spend down that savings about 17 million. Um, the disabled SSI population, so-called permanently disabled population, that's a fairly a pretty arduous process to go through that. Sometimes takes months. Um, going forward, once expansion starts, um, a person might just forego that whole process of applying for permanently and totally disabled category and just sign up for Medicaid uh, itself. If their income falls below 138% of poverty, we believe that some portion of that population would, not 100% of them, maybe 30% of them or so, um, but they're a fairly expensive group. Um, and so that savings is about $56 million. And again, this is new eligibles after the expansion happens, so new expansion eligibles. There'd be some savings from uncompensated care um, that uh, this is complicated in getting into the weeds a bit, but another 56 million. There are women that um, in the pregnant women category, another 38 million in a, f a smattering of other programs, about 31 million. You add all that up, that's where our savings comes from. And just so you know, this is not sort of made up in thin air. The good thing about Missouri is we went 38th in this line. So we, when uh, Abby Barker, who did the line share of this work, um, and our team went and did this analysis, we had a lot of evidence to go in. We could look at other states. We could look at the research. And we know what happened in other states. So we have a long line of research and we we know what's what what the story is. And so this is based on evidence. Uh, I will tell you that our savings are, I think actually relatively conservative because they're based on only the savings in the Medicaid budget. Um, and it does not include savings in the mental health budget, savings in the corrections budget, because we are told not to account for those savings. It's only the savings in the Mo Health Net budget. And, um, but the, re the state recently rece released estimates of those savings and said that they would be about $3 million. Um, I don't know for sure if that makes a reasonable number. It sounds, I'll just say it's a number. Um, they said we didn't estimate the implementation costs of Medicaid. They said it would be $7 million. Again, I have no reason to doubt that number. Um, we did not estimate the effects of the revenue effects of how much would this would be. You know, the state, state would bring in about a billion dollars in federal dollars. That's income to somebody. That's income to nurses and doctors and healthcare suppliers. That could actually raise our revenues quite a bit. We did not account for that. Um, I actually think that could help the state budget quite a bit. Um, I should say that our, with any estimate that economists do, it's could uh, there's uncertainty involved in it. Um, as you can see here, our estimate, our negative 39 million savings is our best estimate. But we we are very clear about our assumptions. If you go look at our paper, um, again, lead author Abby Barker, um, and you can look at what assumptions we made. If you uh, if certain assumptions go in a different direction, it could be as good as $40 million. Um, if they go in a different, I'm sorry, the it could go actually save $95 million or it could actually cost the state about $40 million in 2020. Um, although I will say that those are fairly extreme ends of the scale. Um, and we, we actually think that the more likely is plus or minus 30 million around that estimate in fiscal year 2020. Um, I will tell you actually that um, the auditor asked, told us, pointed out that um, if this gets passed next week, it probably wouldn't be implemented until 2022, not 2020. So um, Abby updated these numbers for um, until 2022. And as you can see, that adjusted the numbers slightly. So the savings are in fact $43 million in 2022. But one of the things you see is the savings grow over time to almost a billion dollars, to roughly a billion dollars in 2026. Um, and that's a very large number. I could talk about answer why that's the case in the, in the Q and A, but the main reason is, is the uh, some of those categories categories of spending, in particular, the permanently and totally disabled um, 
numbers grow over time. So you'll see on the ballot when you vote next week that the range uh, suggests that it could grow to a billion dollars in savings in 2026. As this graph shows in 2026, basically the story is the spending would be about $2.4 billion of additional spending, but um, the state saves a billion dollars and the federal government um, then pays for this additional $1.4 billion. So that's a picture of what the scenario looks like. Just a couple more slides um, before I can take some Q&A. Um, there's always caveats in any estimates. Uh, some of the caveats are, you know, uh, we don't know for sure what the costs will be. Any uh, future costs are uncertain. We explored the experience of other states. As I said, our, our analysis was um, based on the experience of other states. Um, we have confidence in our estimates um, and we lay out our assumptions. There's a, a link that you'll see later. You can play around with our assumptions you want if you you feel like they need to be adjusted. I can tell you that the the assumptions need to be moved pretty far for this to cost the state some money in the short run. Um, the state has found it challenging to keep its costs in check in particular because our IT system is pretty old and uh, outdated, um, but their state is working on that. Some people have argued that the 90% match that the federal government's paying um, won't, might be changed in the future, that it's fluid. You know, this federal government might at a whim just sort of by executive order make that go away. That's not true. I'll just tell you that's not true. The f that has to be changed by a law. The f Congress has to change it and the president has to sign it. And you've seen that the Congress tried to repeal the Affordable Care Act 60 times. It was not able to do it. So remember that um, for this 90-10 match to go away, for the Medicaid expansion to go away, that would take it's not impossible, but that would take what I just said, Congress to make it go away. So those are a few things I'll mention. I'll tell you, I'll just sort of throw this slide up here. All of our work was validated by looking at other sources. We talked to other um, individuals who've done this kind of work around the country. We used um, data sources from um, like American Community Survey, Medical Expenditure Survey, uh, administrative data from the state, and so on. One final thing I'll say is after our work was done and we participated in this analysis, there was an economic analysis done of what would the Medicaid expansion mean for the state from an economic point of view. And here's just, you may have seen some of these numbers out there. The basic bottom line of the story is that the economic effects of the Medicaid expansion would be, uh, would create 16,000 jobs a year. Um, most of those jobs would be outside of St. Louis and Kansas City and about a billion dollars in increase in personal income. So in conclusion, we are facing huge um, challenges, in my opinion, um, in this right now with this COVID crisis that almost that I've never seen in my career. Um, I've talked very fast, but I think, you know, we have a public health crisis, which I'm sure we all know, but I've tried to point out to you how profound and this economic crisis is that we're facing and a racial justice crisis, which I didn't do justice to today, but, um, you know, frankly, I'd be happy to come back and talk about that, but I'm sure I know you have other people that are talking about that as well. Um, but uh, will policy respond? Just a few comments about that. I, I think we've already failed to a great extent, sadly. Um, and some of the numbers I've shown show that if you look at other countries, we're not, they're not facing the recession we're facing. They're not facing the um, COVID crisis we're facing. And if we weren't facing this COVID crisis, we would not be facing this economic crisis. Um, and, and we need to help people respond to these profound challenges. That's just my editorial comment. Um, and um, my view is that, uh, you know, it's appropriate to pay attention to the COVID crisis because we have to solve that crisis first. But the, uh, sorry about that. The, um, the um, until we solve the COVID crisis, 
you know, I think we're in fact sort of probably masking the other crisis, which is the economic crisis. You know, which, you know, if, if that were just going on by itself right now, the social determinants of health would be profound. And people would be going, oh my God, you know, and one of the things they're debating in Washington right now is, or should we pass another bill? And we're about ready to go over a cliff that if they don't pass that bill and unemployment benefits end, people may start losing their houses, they may start starving. Um, maybe it's an overstatement, but, um, but you know, the economic crisis is probably going on around us in ways that we don't realize. Um, and the longer this goes on, and I tried to show you that it could go on for quite a while, um, the health effects and the mental health effects, this could be quite large. Um, and I guess I've tried to passionately tell you that I think it's, we have two really large crises and they're tied together. And they're certainly tied to the racial justice crisis as well in ways that I didn't do justice today. So I'll stop there and see if people have, here's some links. I, the next slide says questions. I'll leave these up there for now, but do you have any questions? Looks like there were 39 thrown into the chat. So. Well, yeah, thank, thank you so much, Tim. And I'll, I'll echo uh, what somebody mentioned in the comments already at uh, just the great pace uh, that you covered such a, an amazing amount of information in just a, such a short time. We have captured uh, you know, a, a number of questions, uh, both on the Medicaid expansion side, as well as the COVID uh, economic impacts uh, workforce and, and employment side. So we'll try, to, we'll, we'll try to cover as many as we can from, from both of those areas. You know, one question that just kind of jumped out, Tim, to start was a really was more of a kind of a theoretical question um, in terms of, you know, how do economists weigh public health versus economic concerns uh, in, in, in thinking about these pressing issues? And then how do those inform the policy decisions that are being made or not? I'll have to tell you that, you know, I'm, I'm a health economist and I'm a, as you know, I'm a health economist that lives in a public health school, you know, school that studies public health. Um, and, you know, I've been talking to economists at some of them in economics departments. And I think this has been a challenge for economists to deal with this question. It's a great question because I don't know if they have ever, you know, the, the really smart ones are, are we're able to come to speed on this question pretty quickly. And the ones that are health economists got it very quickly. But I think that other economists like didn't quite get it. They, they viewed it as like the standard recession, frankly. And like I said earlier, it's like, oh, this is gonna be a V-shaped re recession. Oh, you know, the policymakers told us to stay home. And, and, you know, as soon as they open the doors and tell us to go back to work, it's gonna be okay. Um, you know, it's kind of like, you can just like shut it down and you know turn the spigot off and then turn it back on and it'll be okay and i was sitting there going oh my god you have no idea and you know because i was listening to the public health experts i was listening to bill potterly and the infectious disease people and going like the number of things that need to happen um for this to be okay is really a lot so you know we we need testing we need you know we need you know, masking, we need, you know, you can't just expect people to go back to work and we need the, the workplace to be safe. And um, like people who know me know that I, I'm on an airplane like three or four times a month. I have not been on an airplane since February. I don't wanna go on an airplane. So, cause you, the last place I wanna be is in a tube with a bunch of sick people. So for three hours, so, you know, just think about the economic effects of that alone. Um, so it's like, and I don't think economists quite got that right away. They get it now for sure. Um, and, you know, and so, and I don't, that's why, you know, the CBO chart I showed you, I think really showed it that this is gonna take a long time for this to work out. I don't know if I answered your question, but it, that's the way I'm thinking about it. So I think you've probably heard this. We really need to solve the health crisis before we can solve the economic crisis. Tim, thank you so much. There are so many comments in the chat telling you what a great job you did, and I want to echo those. Um, there was also a question from Bob, and you, you started to allude to the answer, but I wanted to ask you to expand a little bit. Um, assuming that we're successful next week and we get Medicaid expansion in Missouri, 
how long do you think it's going to take to fully implement? Um, will that come to fruition soon enough to help people that are getting sick with COVID? That's a really good question. I've People have asked me that question. We, um, I'm not 100% sure whether it would be, the, the auditor told us to assume it would be January 2022. Um, so that was what the analysis, uh, the second round of analysis is that if you go up on the auditor's website or the Secretary of State's website, that's what that memo says. And um, so we updated our analysis, Abby updated the analysis to January 2022. Um, so that's probably my best guess as to when it would be effect. And people are wondering, well, man, at the past you know, August, you know, if you recall, it was originally supposed to be November, so it'd take about a year. Um, you know, some people have said, well, why can't we do it in July? Because that's usually when the fiscal year starts. I'm not 100% sure why it couldn't be done then. Um, so I've not gotten a definitive answer on that question. Um, I've also wondered whether there'll be some challenges to it. I'll just sort of say that. Um, and, and some people say they'll, um, they'll be how it gets implemented. It's a very clean expansion. By that I mean, you know, the, the people who wrote the expansion didn't put, they just said expand up to 138% period of poverty period. And, you know, there's nothing else in there about work requirements or, you know, healthy making, you know, any other bells and whistles to the program, but I'm sure the legislature is going to want to go in there and muck around with it. Um, and that's probably what will happen from January until May during their legislative session. So expect a lot of noise between January and May. That's just my prediction. Great. So uh, another question on the Medicaid expansion, and, but also kind of starting to segue us a little bit um, into some of the COVID and economic impacts as well. Um, so a question came through about the potential impacts on uh, healthcare and medical providers of Medicaid expansion, if there's yeah. anything you wanted to share on that, and then tied into that, um, actually, and then looking forward, you know, what do, what are you seeing as the path uh, for the healthcare sector to rebound um, from some of the significant impacts from COVID? So, uh, you know, because I had to be somewhat parsimonious in the slides, even though I had a lot of them, um, you know, I could I have talked and I could talk a lot about the impact, for example, on underserved providers, like in rural areas and urban areas. Um, there's, um, so, uh, and that's, you know, that's, um, and I'll flip back a couple slides here to this one. Um, so one thing that's gotten a lot of attention is, uh, and it might surprise people that I've done estimates that, um, maybe about 25% of the population uh, lives in rural areas in Missouri, but about a third of the people that would be covered by Medicaid live in rural areas in Missouri. That would probably surprise you, but remember that um, suburban St. Louis and suburban Kansas City have relatively high incomes. So they have relatively low uninsurance rates. So, um, and people don't know this, but rural Missouri has relatively low incomes and relatively high on insurance rates. So um, the Medicaid expansion would probably help rural Missouri and central cities quite a bit. So the probably the one of the first order effects of this will be to help people that provide uncompensated care to rural and urban people um, right away. Um, so these billion to two billion dollars that's on this chart would would go right away to people that are to the providers that are hurting quite a bit right now, and as um, has been often mentioned, there's um, been depending on how you count it, there have been seven rural hospitals that have closed in the last five years or so in Missouri, been about a hundred across the United States, um, and there's by some measures, um, you know, dozens of others that are on the brink of closing. Um, just in Missouri. Um, and I'm not going to say that these dollars are going to keep them from closing. It's not the only thing that matters. Um, they face a lot of other challenges, including COVID. Um, but having, you know, I will tell you that in some rural hospitals, for example, we've seen numbers that approach 67 or even 80% of their 
their patients are Medicare, Medicaid, and un uninsured. Um, and so if you can, if you got 16, 20% of your population that's uninsured and you were getting 25, 30% of your dollar um, because that's all they can afford to pay and all of a sudden now you're getting 60 to 70% of your dollar because Medicaid is not a great payer, that's a big deal. That's gonna help you. And that would go for physicians as well. That would go for clinics. So it's extra dollars that's gonna flow to that sector that could really help in even good times, but certainly in a recession. Does that help answer the question? So I think, you know, in the short run, that's hopefully what we would see. Um, the research, and there are literally hundreds of studies now that shows that what happened after Medicaid expansion, one of the first things that happened is the patients themselves see their own financial status improve, their own mental health status improve, their own medical debt improve, and then their access to care improve, their primary care access to improve, um, and, and then their health indicators start to improve after that. But the first thing that happens, probably not surprisingly, is they pay less out of pocket. Um, and that's really important. So speaking also about people's pockets, um, Lacey had a question uh, related to the current federal discussion about ex extending the unemployment insurance $600 benefit. Um, do you think that that should be extended? And you know, just why or why not any commentary? Yeah, well, I, you know, I, I'm not, I'm less of an expert about that, but it seems like a, a very logical thing to do because if I, if I told you anything pretty passionately, it was about how big this recession is, and um, and how narrowly it's hitting certain people, and it's the people that probably can't afford to. Um, take a hit. They were probably already suffering. So, um, and, you know, I think the other thing I would say about unemployment insurance is, I don't think this is always well understood. Sometimes people think it's like a handout. It's like, um, you know, it's being paid by people and it's just like free money or something. Remember that unemployment insurance was is a fund. It's an unemployment insurance fund. So you pay into it. Your employer pays into it while you're while you have a job. And so when you get, it's not everybody who gets unemployment insurance. You have had to have a job. And then when you get unemployed, you draw from the unemployment insurance fund. You 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 had to have lost a job. And you, it's an insurance fund. So it's you don't get unemployment insurance unless you previously had a job. So. I don't really begrudge people getting unemployment insurance, even for a long period of time when we're looking at how long these people are gonna be unemployed, that's number one. Number two, you know, you can see how big the hole is in our economy right now. We need dollars to flow to people, to keep them, the economy moving, and, and to keep people literally from being evicted from their houses, from, we start to see food lines I was hoping I would never see food lines in the United States, but we started to see food lines. I don't want to see food lines. I'm sorry, I just did not want to see food lines. That's a public health problem. So I, I think we can do this, um, at least for a few months. You know, again, we hopefully we can, you know, do it for a few months until we solve this public health crisis. And then we can get people back to jobs because people don't want to go to work, you know, as, um, or they can't go to work, you know, as my wife has pointed out to me several times, like the other thing is like, maybe the business opens up, but if you've got some chronic illness and your, your boss calls up and said, you got to come to work, you may not want to go to work if you're, in, if you got some sickness. Um, and then, then what are you going to do? You, you're not, you don't qualify for unemployment insurance. I'll just point that out. Thanks, Tim. And so just as with an eye on the time, we have, uh, we have time for just to fit in one last question. And uh, this is a, a nod to a few of the folks who have commented and, and asked something over the last hour. Um, so Tim, you know, Ch uh, you and colleagues and, and Chep have put out uh, some pretty extensive uh, uh, materials and, and research. So from, from the work that you all have done and even more broadly, um, what are the messages and the evidence um, that you find are resonating the most with policy decision makers? Oh, that's a 
Good question. You know, we've, because we're the Center for Health Economics and Policy, we've tried to focus in on the fiscal side of this um, because that's the question we've asked. So that's number one. And so some of those links you'll see there are, are focusing on, our center is focused a lot on the rural health side. So you'll see a couple of papers that are focused in on that. Um, our, our centers focus a lot also on access issues. So by that, I mean, do um, people with health insurance, um, does it help them get access to healthcare? And there's really, frankly, dozens, if not hundreds of studies that show that, you know, ac access to health insurance does matter. It's not, again, the only thing that matters, but in, you know, you'll find some papers on our website that link you to other research that shows that. So I think those are a few things I'll say that you can find on our website um, that'll link you to other places as well. So, and payment policy, I'll mention that one too real quick. So a deeper topic we can talk about later. So. Next time. Yeah. <laughs> Great, so Tim, um, are we okay to post a PDF of your presentation so people can access these links from oh, our website? Yeah, sure. I went through it really quick. I, I tend to talk really quick when I think it's a lot of slides. So. It's a lot to say. Um, and as we are approaching time, I just want to give you a, a minute to offer any closing comments uh, and words to the audience. Uh, vote, number one. However you're going to vote, I can tell you which way to vote. But uh, number two, um, thank you for listening. And, you know, again, think about those who are suffering. Um, and, you know, I, that's been always my issue that I, th you know, that's our focus at our center in our Institute for Public Health and the Brown School. And I tried to make the point to you that um, I think, you know, appropriately we're focused in right now on people who are suffering from COVID, the issue of disparities or racial justice issues, which as you heard me talk about er earlier, uh, profoundly worried about those issues. But I think one of my points that I've been trying to make here is for but lurking below that surface is the economic question, which is really what I tried to hit home. And, you know, I, I think we really need to be paying more attention to that now, so. Tim, thank you so much for bringing science and data and heart to um, a, a complicated conversation. Really appreciate the audience. Oh my goodness, we had so many smart questions. I think we could have stayed here all day, um, but we will post a recording and uh, Tim's presentation so you can follow up on um, this great material. I want to thank my co-host, Assistant Dean Dan Ferris, for fielding questions and generally being the co-host with the most. Um, thank you all for being here, and we hope to see you again soon at Open It Classroom. Please stay healthy and safe out there, everybody. Bye thank now. You.